If there's a few things you once said, or somebody once said, I'm not sure if it was you actually, the three things have shaped your life, which is say rock and roll, New York, that was probably somebody else, I don't know, and uh, literature. Now, you, you studied literature in college in 61 in Syracuse University. Did that give you a something for it, or did that actually take a something away, do you think? A lot of people think that when they went to formal education, it wasn't very good for them, really, in terms of their creativeness and for whatever it was they were interested in. Oh, I think it was really good to be... I met some teachers I really liked. Um, I got to read Finnegan's Wake in a way that I wouldn't have been able to normally, which was a great thing right there. And what was it about Joyce then? Like, I mean, is there something special about Joyce? I mean, is there any part of Ulysses that you particularly might have seen that might have been a part of you? Well, I mean, well? Molly Bloom's soliloquy is one of the most astonishing pieces of writing in the entire world as we know it. Yeah. I mean, I've read that over and over and over. What an astonishing thing to read. Finnegan's Wake, which I cannot read by myself, yeah. but I had, a, I had a teacher who would read it out loud. And oddly enough, when it's read out loud, it's very easy to understand. It's really funny. But I myself have never been able to successfully read it alone. Well, is, is that teacher John Moore Schwartz? And is it important? Yeah. And when you met that guy, I mean, what kind of, what did you get from him? Say, I mean, was there something really quite astonishing and amazing about him that maybe he should have been more recognized or something before the madness that he succumbed to? Well, there certainly was something special and unique about him. He was a great writer, and he was incredibly brilliant and very funny, and very depressed. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but out of his mind. Yeah. Do you see yourself as a writer? Yeah. And do you think that the writing But not involves... just a writer. Okay. But do you think that the writing involves an emotion that isn't necessarily you, and therefore to get back to something you said earlier on, don't necessarily take everything on face value as being Lou Reed, you know, Lou Reed's son. Well, fascinating as I am, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not all that interesting. There are... Uh, and also, when you write something, you have to remember, you know, you're taking something over a period of years and you're compressing it and you're yeah. adding people in and you're making things go a certain way, maybe because it's funnier or it's more tragic or it's this or it's that, it's writing. Some people would call it lying. When you have actors, you know, the thing about an actor, and I'm sure they'll tell you, is there are people who are really good at lying. Now, if you want to say there's some real depth to all that lying, yeah. good point. Yeah. there you go, have yeah. fun. Yeah. Do you think in any way that, um, like if you said once that you want to be the greatest writer on earth, that if... Oh, I don't think I said that. Well, okay, well, if it was, if, 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 if it was um, unjustly attributed to you, which it has been, uh, would you say in some ways that if you ever wanted to write or wanted to make the greatest American novel or something, mm -hmm. that in terms of what Lou Reed might be, that each album is like a chapter in that novel? I think, you know, the great American novel is just a cliché Yeah, well, that's that. true. But yeah. I thought, I really do... And I still think it, that if you put these albums, think of them as, as chapters in an ongoing saga of uh, life in a contemporary city in the 20th century. Do you think that if you wanted to be, like, I mean, oh, maybe not the greatest writer in the world or whatever, but like, you did say on Magic and Loss, it can't be Shakespeare, can't be Joyce, I think it was, and that your ambitions in that field are your realization that you weren't going to maybe go up to the top of that very mountain of Joyce or whatever or Shakespeare had waned and that was, that was cool and you came to a, an acceptance of something. No, it's a, well, I mean, yes and no. Yes, I certainly know that, but I've always known that. Right. Everybody, okay. I think anyone who writes knows that about it's themselves. It's not though you've no yourself beforehand thinking that you might... You'd have to really be in the egotist yeah, of all time yeah, to say, okay. boy, I can, I can really give Shakespeare yeah. a run. Hamlet's nothing. Look at this. One of the things that we saw you most around this part of the world in, in the last few years was with you two, on tour with you two. Yeah, except everybody thinks Bono wrote Satellite of Love. <laughs> Can I tell them? Yeah. My dears, I wrote Satellite of Love, just so you know. Well, sure, no, I mean, David Bowie with Nine Inch Nails. Mm. Everybody thinks that Kurt Cobain wrote, wrote um, The Man Who Sold the World. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, That's very funny. Okay, listen, just one thing then. Like, do you, um, like, if, even if you don't look back on your music or whatever from the past. If what? If you don't look back on your music and, like, sort mm. of listen to it or whatever. Mm. Are you ever. I hear it on the radio, though. Right, yeah. But are you ever amazed and gladdened, saddened, or just doesn't mean anything to you, of the effect that Velvet Underground had 
in terms of like some, so, somebody once said that when the albums actually came out first, only a hundred people heard them. Every single one of those hundred people Eno. picked up a guitar. Eno is responsible was, was, for that remark. That it's pretty good response. Or it's, it's a pretty good remark, isn't it? Eno is pretty smart. I mean, like, I mean, he's demonstrated he's still here. He's one of the world's great producers. Uh, I think it's true, yeah. as remarks go. But it, it is, isn't it? I mean, like, it's influenced yeah. in the 70s and 80s. It's phenomenal. It was a great idea. It's too bad, you know, the group couldn't have lasted longer pursuing it, but it was a great idea. And when you had what I might call a sort of rebirth in some ways with the Transformer and... Um... I mean, you have to just be... to realize, you know, if you're around for any length of time, you're going to be stuck singing these lyrics over and over and over. Mm. You really better be good. And if you can't engage someone mentally, how interesting can the shit be? And it can't be too trendy because if you're stuck with it 10 yeah. years later, it'll be like wearing some really old socks. Fair enough. Okay, well then finally, Lou, um, as the rock and roll animal of the 1970s, do you think that you did transform into the political animal of the 80s and it's still with you? For instance, you once said when you did the Amnesty tour, you couldn't not speak out about uh, the abuse of human rights. Well, some things are just so horrifying that, I mean, I'm not a political activist, by any stretch of the imagination. But on occasion, there are people I know who are, and they'll bring you something that's so awful. You know, say, I want to go do this, would you help with that? You know, you know, just do a little show or a little, which is easy for someone like me to do, yeah. I mean. Yeah, How hard is it to do that? So it's one of the few things celebrities good for, you know, getting a good table in a restaurant and being able yeah. to do a benefit, you know. So, I, you know, people, you know, like you uh, 2 or Peter Gabriel, you know, Peter's always ears really to the ground for these things. Uh, I'm not, you know, I, but there are, are certain people whose opinions I take very seriously about these things. And, and then it seems to be the least you could do. And around the time of, say, Coney Island Baby and Rock and Roll Heart, do you think the drugs around that time had blurred the critical impetus? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the input that you wanted to put into things, and to, it had really gotten away. And so you're I, don't an I don't answer questions like that. All right, well then, one thing then, in terms of yourself, do you think mm. that in terms of the characters that are in the songs, mm. necessarily, do you think you over-identified with them some, sometimes? And you no. start to live the songs? In, in That's absurd. Extent? Is it? That's really stupid. But why? Sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you just said there that, like... I don't, I don't, I don't create a character, and then it, it's like bad Hollywood B-movie, you know, like the guy's, one of these movies <laughs> where the guy's a ventriloquist in a nightclub, it's a very famous German movie, and the puppet starts becoming alive, and the puppet's taking over, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and, oh, the story I wrote's taking over, and, oh, the character Lou Reed's taking over, oh, please, it's too stupid. It's so romantic. Well, it is. It's yeah. such a romantic way. It's horseshit. Okay, Trust Lou. Me. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks a million, Lou. Yeah.